What I really want to talk about is the future of decision making and the hybrid decision making future that we're going to be in between the automation of machines and the human and how we can optimize that better than we have so far. So let me ask a question. Has more data in the world that we all have huge in huge volumes, has that led to better decisions? Not as much as it should have done yet, I think is the answer. In some areas, very good, some areas not so good, but it seems like we haven't got as many better decisions as the amount of data we have should suggest. You know, another way of asking the same question, have we got the best return on investment for the data plus the data science that we're currently doing? And I think, again, the answer is pretty nuanced. Not really. So there's a growing problem, as we all know, which is sort of data overload, in a sense, not being able to see the... Uh, the wood from the trees, in a sense. And the question is, how do we do this optimization better than we have been? And what are the problems we're facing, and how can we fix them? Well, one of the data challenges today, I think, is, is these sorts of three sets of issues. We have data that's available, no question about it. But is it accessible? Is it actually practically accessible for the decisions you want to make? We have average data, but is it personalized? We're getting much better at that, but is it specifically what you need, not what an average person like you might need? And are the answers sort of insightful answers, or are they just answers which may or may not lead us to better decisions? Well, in a sense, what we've been doing at Wolfram for the last 30 years, and my day job is, in a sense, computation for everyone. We believe a solution to this conundrum is making computation at a high level much more available for practical use for people. And we're kind of pushing the envelope of that over time. And I want to explain more about that for the rest of this talk. And in a sense, part of that is smart automation of being able to work with the data. Not necessarily fully automating every decision you get, but being able to work with the data at a higher level. Now, there's a, another side of this, which I'll come back to at the end, which is everyone for computation and the need for people to understand how to do better computational thinking. So right now, we have a situation, particularly through math at school, where people aren't really learning these skills very well. And we've got to step that up to the next level now that we have computers that can do so much more. So how do we achieve the highest level insightful computation for everyone? What are the barriers to that right now, and how, how do we get better at it? Well, the first thing to do is review what's worked well for computation and what hasn't. So there are sort of traditional computation domains. Uh, traditionally, that didn't involve much data. Things like physics and scaling up paper and pencil techniques and well-structured models and simple to specify questions of data. So those have worked well for some time. Uh, we've, we've added to that new techniques like machine learning that enable mass ways to look at data and decisions in a slightly different way. Um, what's still to develop, though, is we're still on the cusp, I think, of being able to handle fuzzy questioning. When you ask a fuzzy question, can you really get the answer you want? Rapid deployment of new ideas, you know, communicating and contracts with computation. Smart contracts are in their infancy. I think they're very important. And the utility of sort of modern data structures, you know, we're, we're used to grids, matrices, and simple data structures. And I think we can do much better um, with that. So one of the things I want to explain is why I think a multi-paradigm approach is so critical. So often what happens is people say, you know, I've got this problem. I'm going to use machine learning for this problem. Or I'm going to use traditional statistics or something. This is typically the wrong approach. We have many, many, many different techniques. The question is, which set of techniques is best for the problem at hand? So kind of a multi-paradigm way of thinking about this is saying, use the best tools for the job. Don't pre-select which set of tools it is. So machine learning is great for certain kinds of things, not so good for other. Algorithmic approaches might be better. So don't channel into this before you kind of know what your problem is. Now, another thing I think it's important to do is start from the interface and work backwards. At some point, these decisions are interfacing with humans. There's a point to the decision, which is to do something better for humans. 
The question is, what is the right interface for that particular style of decision, and how can we kind of work on that? So here's an example uh, that we've done a lot of work on, which is linguistic access. So if you go to our, um, uh, for example, our, our Wolfram Alpha, and uh, you can do a query. So I might do a query like uh, CO2 of UK versus, um, oh, I don't know, BP share price or something. And the question is, can I actually get a computation based on this happening in real time? And uh, there we got, um, it kind of figured out what I meant. And unlike doing a search, like Google would do, it's gone off and computed an answer. It's understood the question. It's computed an answer. It's come up with these pods. It's then done a nice graph of us um, to show the comparison between these, whether relevant or not. And this is all computable data ready to do some more from. So that's a typical sort of example. I mean, you can have more fun and ask quantitative examples, like, am I drunk, for example? Um, and uh, you know, it's amazing what's quantifiable in the modern world. Uh, and here you see some sort of app that's been built live. So I can go and change. I'm afraid my body mass is rather higher than that. Um, so you can go change this and, and recompute it and so forth. So this is sort of computational knowledge accessed through linguistics. That's a one way we, we might want to do that. Um, so another thing you can do is do this um, through Siri on your iPhone, for example. CO2, uh, actually, let me do a different one. Let me do uh, GDP of UK versus France. And uh, uh, try again. It's, GDP of UK versus France. So Siri willing, uh, we will get a result. And so in fact, Apple sent this to Wolfram Alpha. And this is a Wolfram Alpha result showing that comparison there, which I'm just showing um, on, my, uh, on my video. So I can talk to my phone, and I can get actual computations done. That's one style of interface, what I would call a drive-by interface. Here's another kind. Um, what I would call knowledge apps, so interactive apps that are sort of built for the purpose of understanding knowledge, not built as a sort of app that you use every day necessarily. This is an example for a, a country in the Middle East where we're actually using the full data set of their population to work out heart disease risk based on different parameters uh, like your age and whether you're male or female and so forth. So that's a typical thing embedded here in, in my notebook. Here's another example, what I would call sort of more linguistic programming. Uh, let's say something like hi history of um, cows in, uh, in UK versus France. Uh, I'm not sure. And this is, uh, let's see if this actually uh, computes from this. And there we've actually got a, a sort of utterance I've given it. In a sense, it's written a little piece of code, not a very sophisticated piece of code. And now I could say, let's do a list plot of that. And I've immediately used that data to actually do something. So you can see this is an interface that somebody who isn't really a programmer could use, but could kind of get programmatic results. So that kind of interfacing to data is really critical to get it used better. So another issue is sort of using high-level language both to actually produce results and get stuff out quickly and also just to communicate. So this was an example. Your bloodhound, the 1,000-mile-an-hour uh, car, has been in the news recently again. But earlier, we were uh, connecting with the team. And this was from the previous uh, Thrust SSC data. And we were analyzing this data. And because we could do it easily and quickly, we could get things out using things like wavelets, lots of techniques that they had, the team had never seen in 20 years of having looked at this data. And we could just do it straight out, make dashboards. This is all the code that, uh, that we use to generate these things. And you can see here we're showing uh, the effect of the data as you uh, move the time on what actually happened in the car. And it's kind of cool that we could build this in a, in a, you know, in a couple of hours. With that, That's the total code needed for that just example I showed. So it's very important that you have a high-level language to interface with data. So another way, I guess, I'm, what I'm saying here is you need to empower the knowledge consumer to generate knowledge. The consumer and the generator of knowledge are becoming the same thing. The question is, can we get more and more people to generate the level of knowledge they need to be able to make the right decisions? And a typical sort of way to think about this, think about management decisions. You know, years and years ago, kind of most management decisions were by instinct. Well, this felt right, this didn't feel right, there weren't a lot of numbers in it. Now we've got to a sort of era where we have what I might call simple targets. You know, if the three metrics for this hospital match, maybe it's running well. 
we all know that doesn't quite work because people game the targets, they're too simplistic, they don't really show the, the quantity of richness. Um, I think the way forward is what I would call agile targets, where you publish a computable data set of what you're interested in, effectively, and the user of that data is then deciding what questions they'll ask of that data. But they've got to have high enough level tools to be able to do that. You can't expect most people to be a programmer who can go into the data. And you've also got to have the data in a good set of form so that the tools are um, immediately able to do that. Now, here's an example that happened a few years ago. There's a, somebody who's uh, um, actually a professor of law, and he was explaining uh, in the House Committee in Texas uh, why they should, I think, should not buy hurricane insurance, why it was a waste of money in his view. Now, this is, looks like an academic paper like you'd see you know, in many places. The only difference with this is uh, it actually works. So at some point during the actual uh, hearing, you can go and, and actually try things. Instead of making a decision by saying we've got these two options, you can actually start pulling sliders around and make a decision in real time by discussing where the slider should be, for example. So this is a very powerful modern way of making decisions when you have good interfaces and good technology for doing that. So let's just review the barriers to ubiquitous computation workflows. Uh, we've talked a bit about uh, the interface. We also need to talk a bit about the data. How does the data look? Now, it might be wonderful if you can just throw any data in and the computer will work out what to do, but the practice of the world isn't like that right now. Not yet, anyway. Um, then there's the sort of ecosystem of the technology, and then, as we'll come back to, what the human needs to do to be able to work with this and come out and not be fooled by, by the computer. Let's talk about the different processes of data automation. So I've just picked out three here. There's search. We're very familiar with that. And what works well there is it's sort of powerful for eking out existing info. It's not very good for generating new knowledge. It's kind of like, if somebody's done it already, you can find it, that's wonderful. If you're trying to do something brand new, not so good. Then there's what I call AI curation. And you know, this is where you hope machine learning techniques and other things will just pull full things from text and so forth that humans have written. Great to work from existing data, but I think in many cases it's not really working that well yet. I think it's been somewhat overclaimed so far. And there's the kind of approach we've taken with Wolfram Alpha, which is computational. You know, it's great for producing new knowledge insights. The negative is you've got to get your data more in shape for it to work right. And, of course, that can have other benefits too. So we need a shift in data quality from what I would call human-readable data to citizen data, you know, data that's relevant for citizen computation. It's no good having 100,000 data points you can read. Nobody cares. What you need is those data points set up correctly so they're ready to compute from. The meaning is installed in the data, not just the numbers. And that's kind of what we do when we curate data for Wolfram Alpha, and there's a very powerful way forward, I think, at this time. And I mean, just to show you an example, um, this uh, is data we have standardly curated, and this is um, uh, looking up a sequence of base pairs in the human genome, and this is hopefully going to uh, look this up in real time, and uh, there we go. Oh my gosh, I did rather a big side. I didn't put a long enough sequence in. There were 960 uh, sections of the human genome that matched this. But isn't it amazing that now, on a laptop, in front of you, in a few seconds, I can pull up a search of the human genome, which was thought impossible to decode 20 or 30 years ago in, in, a, in a short time, and I can search it, and the data is ready to compute from in this sort of way. We're thinking where the knowledge assets are that we have to get computable. So we've got them. Uh, we've got some. We've computed. We've uh, curated a lot of data. Of course, you have a lot of knowledge assets as well. And one of the things we sometimes do for customers is we go in and help them curate that ready for linguistic queries. And of course, your customers have data as well, which you may want to interact with and get meaning out of. And one of the things I think is important to think about is how you build a computable data layer in your organizations. It's kind of like you don't need to change everything, but you need to install like a computable data layer that sucks in data from different places and is set up to make it computable. And that allows a much higher level use of that data. OK, so that's what, in a sense, the vision is for multi-paradigm data science and, and the future of decisions. Let me talk a bit about what we are trying to do with respect to that. So we're, in a sense, 
you know, infrastructure for injecting computation everywhere. What we've been trying to do is build this sort of ecosystem that allows you to, at the highest possible level, interface, set up, interact with data, and inject it into your decision making. And you know, for those of you who are interested, one of the key technologies that makes this possible for us to do well is we rely on things called symbolic expressions that lie under the surface of every single thing our ecosystem does. And just to show you what that means, if you look at data as it's presented in, in Wolfram language, underneath the surface it's the symbolic expression. Math is also a symbolic expression. So are graphs, so are images, so are documents. Everything is completely unified. And that means there's tremendous power because you can go between these traditionally separated areas and you can work between them. And you know, programs are just examples, of course. They're just symbolic. And the interface. This notebook that I'm showing you is a symbolic expression. It's just an example, like a piece of math is. It's an example of a symbolic expression. You can operate on this notebook uh, in a smart way. So one way I describe our Wolfram language, which is sort of underlying this, is it's a kind of trio of different capabilities. And it's a programming language. We think it's kind of nice programming language. It's very high level. It interacts with Python and many traditional other languages. Um, but it's, it's two more things that those things aren't. It's a superset computation representation. If you want to represent anything in a computational way, we've figured out a high level good way to do it. And it's a human sort of technical communication language. It's sufficiently high level that many people who aren't programmers can interact directly with the language without you building extra interface on top of that. And those turn out to be very important issues, I think, in the future of data. Now, I thought I would try and do a little program for you here. So what I'm going to try and do is, um, you're probably pretty bored of seeing me by now because I've been standing up here for a few minutes. So I thought I would try and block my face out. And um, what I might do is I might, to, let's see, I want to apply a graph. So what I want to do is put a rectangle over detecting my face. And uh, I'm just going to write the code here for this. It's always slightly harder in front of people than it is uh, by oneself. But um, let me, so I'm finding faces on me. That's a built-in algorithm. It's kind of nice that it's there. And now hopefully if I've done this right, it should go. And there you see my face is indeed blocked out. Um, even though it's a quite a dark background behind, you can probably see that that's happened. So it's pretty nice that in front of you in a minute or something, I can write a piece of code that does quite a sophisticated bunch of things. The code is fairly, I mean, it's, I've written in a fairly intricate way, but it's not that hard to understand what it's doing. And of course, this is, you know, there are many simpler things you could do, but just to give you an idea of, of how that is. Now, a key technology that we also have is these notebooks. It's actually amusing because we've had Wolfram notebooks for at least 25, 30 years. And now suddenly, everybody else wants notebooks as well, and has, uh, has taken that away. Um, so it's actually quite nice for us, because now notebooks are in the ascendancy, even though we think we have the best and the most functional ones. But the, the advantage of notebooks is they're a way to represent ideas in an interactive way that really is important for communication. And you know, it's a superset container. It's this presentation. And a crucial part of that is having this language that you can, that's sort of literate. Now, how do smart contracts fit with this? Well, smart contracts really are a way in which humans can kind of directly have a contract that executes and that you're not sort of dependent on kind of lawyers interpreting the English, in a sense. And if you think about what's necessary to achieve good smart contracts, notebooks are actually really, really helpful to this. Um, so this is an example. We were making a smart contract, and uh, the, um, this is in a sense, a template for a smart contract for our sales folks and their incentive plans. And in a sense, you could generate this from a notebook, and you can get uh, you know, a, essentially um, a smart contract that you might, might produce. And in a sense, this is sort of from that template. This is a smart contract from that, which actually produces, you know, computes, pulls in the right data, computes the results. This is, in a sense, what we are agreeing that, that the incentive plan is going to be. So that's a very simple example of sort of how one might think of, um, of smart contracts, uh, hopefully. So and something has, some gremlin has hit me. There we go. Uh, no, I don't want to save that. Right, there we go. So another key technology is having a central uh, cloud, computation cloud, that's kind of allows you to deliver computation as a service, either internally or to your customers. 
And so we built a sort of enterprise private cloud that manifests our, all of these things I've been talking about and allows you to kind of have the central high-level way to do computation feed data in and out. So a key thing for a sort of unified platform is a mixture of data, algorithms, language, linguistics, and notebooks. And it's kind of like, you know, it's a kind of a Apple versus Android kind of discussion on you need to get these things in a good unified way before you, uh, before you have them kind of open to everyone because it kind of makes it work much better to do that. And that's kind of what we've, we've tried to do. Now, here's a typical thing that you do when you've got stuff unified. Um, you can hopefully build a whole uh, set of you know, AI type things rather easy. This is being very, very nice to me. Um, I'm asking for the facial age that it detects. Oh, no, that's not being so nice now. And what this is doing is running a whole bunch of things to figure out what it detects in this based on some machine learning that's been done. But it's also detecting me and putting it through the linguistics, et cetera, et cetera, to try and uh, explain how it views this data that it's got. So it's, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, intermediate, and hopefully, I don't quite know why. It doesn't seem to know what my, um, and uh, OK, let me. Uh, OK, now I promised I would talk for a few minutes about the human end of this. Um, my, my evening job is to basically fix what I consider is completely broken math education around the world. For years of our life, we're getting students to learn things that I think isn't exactly what they're going to need. In fact, it's less and less what they're going to need in AI age. And I founded computer-based math and computationalthinking.org to help basically do something, you know, sounds straightforward. Rebuild the math curriculum assuming computers exist. This has yet to be done in any country in the world. And the sort of, um, you know, post-education version at computationalthinking.org to imbue that computational thinking. So, a few quickly on this. Now, what are today's survival skills as a human? Well, they're not fires outside caves anymore. They were some hundreds of years ago. They're not now. What are they? What are the top value-added skills that humans really need in this AI age? And what are the things that we need to put together to achieve those? Well, I'm going to argue that one of those is, for both of those cases, is computational thinking. You've got to be able to interact with computation at a high level to be able to work with this modern hybrid age with AIs. And the question is, is that manifested by maths education? And I think the answer is largely no. I think it's probably about an 80% problem. So here's the problem. What maths is, basically, or computational thinking, is you're defining questions, you're abstracting to a mathematical form, usually code today, you're computing answers from that question to get, uh, to get the abstract answer, and then you're interpreting the results, and you're seeing whether they make sense. Math education today is basically spending all its time doing hand calculating, mostly of things that aren't being used. And what we need to do is fix that so that we're spending most of the time on these other three steps and getting the computer to spend most of its time doing step three. So that's the, that's the quick summary. And it's very interesting, actually, when we launched Mathematica uh, in 1988, Steve Jobs, I found this quote relatively recently, Steve Jobs came up with this. He said, Mathematica will revolutionize the teaching and learning of math by focusing on the pros of mathematics without getting lost in the grammar. He was so right, and he was so wrong. I highlighted Will because we're still waiting for this right now. We and other people have revolutionized how computations worked outside the classroom, but not inside. And that's a problem we've sort of urgently got to fix. So look, back to, to Wolfram and what we've been doing and where we're going next. Uh, we launched in 1988, as I said, and many things in between. We've launched technical services uh, back a few years ago. So we're now a mixture of a technology company and the company to help uh, people actually use data science and other techniques um, to optimize their decisions. And we're doing things like, for example, we launched block blockchain labs last year um, to help in that space. Um, and so there are many ways we can help you guys. Um, enterprise data analytics, uh, introducing technology and linguistics, access to your data, and of course, computational thinking, education, and so forth. Um, in a sense, what we'd like to do is help turn your data sets into data assets, uh, is one, one other way to put that. So thanks very much indeed. We are at Stand 430 out there, and uh, this should be a cloud version of my talk, though this is a very beta version, so it will not, it has a few gremlins in. But uh, thanks very much, and if we have any questions in a few minutes for that, that would be great too. Thank you.